how do we take all the information that we see and put that into structured forms? Because yes, in terms of just journaling, you know, simple documents are great. But when we start to see the complexity of the world out there and pulling that together, there's a broader structure. Now, to kick things off, I, I wanted to address uh, the title I just threw out there and what you do for a living, because it's not very typical. Having the title of futurist could attract a lot of speculation. So why don't we just start by describing what exactly you do as a futurist and what it is you don't do? That's a, that's a great question, because one of the reasons is that uh, there's a lot of parvenu over the last uh, few years who started to call themselves futurists. Uh, whereas this is something where since the 90s, I've been working professionally as a futurist. So I predicted quite some time ago that now would be a good time to be a futurist. And uh, in that case, I was right. So what a futurist doesn't do, well, I, actually, let me, let me take a step back in the sense that there are many types of futurists or people call them foresight professionals in some cases, uh, there are many disciplines and many approaches. There are 43, or I think 44 at last count, university programs around the world that train, uh, educate people in uh, foresight practices or PhD programs. There's a lot of uh, rigor and discipline to the art and science of thinking about the future. And many, I suppose, uh, philosophical differences, as you would expect in any, any discipline. So my particular approach is, I suppose, close to the, the broader consensus in the uh, discipline, which is you can't predict the future. The future is inherently unpredictable. However, we do have evidence. We have hints and guesses and clues and uh, things that give us some way to think in a structured way about the future. So it's not as if we know nothing about the future. We do have some evidence which allows us to make some educated ways of thinking about the future. And that includes not necessarily predicting, say that we predict that this will happen, but that there are these potential paths, and these are the things which could shape those paths, and these are the things we could influence, the ways in which we can shape those paths to potentially be more favorable to us as individuals, or as companies, or as a society. So my role as a futurist, as I see it, is to help leaders, organizations to think more effectively about the future, to probably think more about the future than they might have otherwise, so that they can act better in the present by understanding some of those forks in the road. So that involves speaking. So I'm a keynote speaker. I just, uh, facilitate strategy sessions uh, with clients and you know, part of it sharing content and thinking to assist these leaders and organizations to be more effective about thinking about the future. We, we all need, I think almost everybody needs to think more about the future than they do. We get pulled back to the present. The present is very demanding, it, uh, demanding of our attention. There's all sorts of things arising at all fronts. And so we pull back to the present. And so it does require some discipline. It does require us to make an effort to carve out the time, to, carve, to realize the energy is important to be thinking about, you know, not just next month, but next year, three years, five years, seven years. If we want to have a successful organization or successful investments in five years or 10 years, we do need to have some kind of a sense of what the world will look like, what will be shaping that, and what it is we can do to take advantage of those or to be able to make, make those trends even better. I love that. And I agree that in working and thinking about the future is important. Jeff Bezos, back when he was CEO of Amazon, used to say that uh, he had the best job in the world because he got to live in the future. And uh, yes. I always love that quote. And, and if you think about it, if you think of a company like Amazon, wouldn't it be nice to uh, have the foresight and kind of know what the future might look like uh, to better understand the opportunity you might have had back in the, you know, say, early 2000s after the dot-com bubble <laughs> and buying a stock like Amazon. Um, I certainly didn't have that foresight back then, and I don't think a lot of people did. But uh, it is important uh, to understand where we are going. Um, 
And so we're going to talk a lot about that as, as well as the daily distractions that come along the way. One theory that you've had and held for a long time is that the economy would become more and more centered around individuals instead of major corporations over the long term. And that's proving to be, I think, very correct. Uh, COVID seemed to really accelerate that experiment um, and that type of economy. But there's also been a considerable amount of disruption of work along the way um, with that model uh, that we saw through COVID as well. So has anything from the pandemic reshaped your thinking around an individual-centric economy? I suppose it has, if anything, accelerated, as you've just accelerated and brought more to bear. So back pulling back to that frame, you know, it's a long time ago. It said, you know, shifting from an economy where organizations are the center of the economy to one where the individuals are the center of the economy. And so this has been manifested in a number of ways. Part of it is that power more broadly is shifting from institutions to individuals, from governments to citizens, from uh, organizations to their customers, to health institutions to patients, and from employers to employees. So this is particularly, particularly pertinent in the current uh, job situation. And so that, that's one thing is that individuals have more power, but we're also starting to see that organizational boundaries are blurring. So more and more people, uh, in fact, you know, the majority of Fortune 500 companies are using, say they are using extensively in some form, external labor be they freelancer platforms, uh, distributed innovation, a whole array of different ways in which they are not just using their staff. So this starts to build a world in which it is more and more tenable to be an individual, to have many options, to be able to create not just a business, but also a portfolio of different uh, work opportunities and to have more and more choices around that. So this trend has, I think, been very evident for the last decade, it has accelerated further. And I, I don't see nothing which is pulling us away from that. In fact, if we start to push forward, for example, looking at the rise, potential rise of distributed autonomous organizations, so uh, crypto or blockchain-based organizations, where essentially I, I think the original description of uh, Vitalik Buterin, who was the founder of Ethereum, who came up with the concept of distributed or, or, uh, automated organizations, is that it is automation at the center, humans at the edges. And so this is where essentially the AI or the systems or the structures or the processes in the middle are the ones that are essentially the managers, uh, allocating work, allocating resources, having structures to do that, and the actual work is being formed by individual humans, who again, of course, have choice in their participation in that. So seeing more and more ways in which value creation is being distributed across arrays of individuals, as opposed to just these economic entities called organizations. And so going back to the sort of the what's happened in COVID is this of the grand experiment, as I've called it, of individuals going uh, working from home uh, has meant that they've said, hey, well, actually, this is not too bad. And uh, I'd love when things go back to relatively normal, I'd uh, like to have a bit more of this. And so that's, again, part of that power to the individual and forcing organizations to rethink how it is they are structured in terms of physical location, how it is they are structured in terms of giving autonomy to individuals be able to create value. And of course, you know, all effective leaders have understood for a long time that you can only achieve anything at scale if you're giving autonomy to talented people as opposed to directing them what to do. Very interesting. It's been a while since I've heard people talk about decentralized autonomous organizations like the DAOs of the world were such a hot trend word, maybe like uh, six months to a year ago. And I feel like it's kind of fallen off just from my personal experience, just not seeing it as much in the threads. And I think probably that's partly tied to the fact that a lot of crypto uh, prices have just declined so rapidly. Maybe it fell out of popularity fairly quickly, but is the concept there um, actually something viable that you foresee becoming, uh, you know, catching hold for real uh, in the near future? Well, I think there's, there's plenty of people that do, do see plenty of talk of uh, the DAO. Of course, of course. Still, <laughs> if, you're, if you're in those circles. And if you catalog the, the array of organizations that call themselves DAOs today, there's a lot, and it's growing rapidly. However, 
I, I feel that those are relatively crude manifestations of the original vision of DAOs. I mean, they are simply aggregates of individuals, you know, using a crypto platform, sometimes using voting structures to be able to achieve their aims. And they, they were in the news recently when there was a DAO which was trying to buy the original uh, Declaration of Independence. Failed bid, but it was, yeah, and that, 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 that didn't need necessarily crypto structure to, to do it, but it was an effective aggregation. So I think it is inevitable. There's more and more, I think, very, very, very interesting entrepreneurs that I know that are discussing ways to be able to reshape their organizations at DAOs uh, in the not too distant future. So I think we're going to see not just more of that in the news, but more actually substantive shifts to new organizational structures. And I think the broader point being here is that traditional organizational structures are limited. The, uh, the uh, limited company has many benefits. It has a lot of flexibility, has a lot of structure. It's obviously thrived in the uh, Darwinian evolution of the economy over the last uh, centuries. But we can certainly envisage and I think imagine that there are going to be more adaptations or variations on economic structures. So we're starting to see there are already uh, legislation in at least one US state to enable DAOs to exist, where you don't, there isn't necessarily a human center or director or core. And we will see more legislation enabling that. But whether the legislation is there or not, we will see more and more of these structures flourish. And you know, the, I suppose a parallel to this is the, uh, I suppose the very much discussed uh, The Network State by Balaji Sirinivasan, which has just come out, which looks at this idea of conglomerates of individuals declaring themselves as ultimately sovereign entities. And so that's an organization of a kind. You know, we think of nations and corporations quite different. They are, of course, at the moment, but there could be some blurring of that as we evolve. Fascinating. You know, one of the main reasons I wanted to touch on your background and what you do day to day is to give the listeners an idea of the amount of information you are continuously digesting to create strategies for companies in, in vastly different industries. So how has your experience shaped the frameworks you lay out in your new book? So my, my, my new book, uh, Thriving on Overload, is, uh, comes back to a concept I created actually in the 90s. This idea that oh, well, we've, I wrote an article 25 years ago called "Information Overload: Problem or Opportunity," and my view, of course, at the time was that it was an opportunity. Of course, since then we have also quite a lot more overload, and this has been shaped not just in my time. So this was actually com- coming from financial markets. So I worked for Merrill Lynch, worked for Thomson Financial. I was. Uh, global director of capital marks at Thomson Financial. And what I saw in the financial markets was that this was a place where people had more information than anyone else. And this was particularly the time when, uh, you know, early in the days of the internet or pre-internet. And their ability to create value, to be able to make trading decisions, to assist their clients, to be able to structure effective deals was based on their ability to take an unlimited amount of information and to be able to make better decisions from that. So that's the original place that I saw this and built my thesis. And so since then, as you said, and becoming not only doing this kind of work with uh, major organizations, but being a futurist specializing in quite a few different industries. So most of my work looks at the future of particular industries. So I do have specific deep uh, expertise in future financial services, professional services, media, and technology. But I also do substantial work in the future of education, government, retail, and health. And I also do a lot of work on future of work and future of organizations. So all of these domains, uh, of course, mean that I, I myself have quite a lot of information that I have to deal with in my, my everyday work. So when I give my speeches, one of the most common questions at the end is, how on earth do you keep on top of everything? And partly my book is a way of cataloging what I have observed myself doing, but also the many people that I know and have worked with over the years who I describe as information masters, those people who are inherently uh, able to 
thrive, prosper, just to, to be excel in a world of unlimited innovation. And, and many of them are investors, be they professional investors, individual investors, institutional investors. I do a lot of work with the institutional investment community or, or uh, venture capitalists, where I think it's a lot more interesting in the sense that they have far less quantitative data uh, to be able to assess uh, when you're looking, of course, at early stage companies compared with uh, public companies. One thing I loved about the book is your ability to distill a bunch of concepts down into visuals and, and actually even talking about how powerful that idea is. So it shows how deeply you've thought about something and, and how well you can explain it to somebody else if you can put it into some kind of easy to understand visual. And the visuals that stuck out to me were around the five powers that you created or, or identified. So if you would help us understand what the five powers are, are to manage information overload, and maybe we go through them one by one. So the yeah the subtitle of the book is the five powers uh, for success in a world of exponential information, and so that's this as you say distillation of all of the practices and frames around where I think into these five domains, which are purpose, framing, filtering, attention, and synthesis. So to just expand uh, a little on those, purpose. We, we need to know why we look at information in the first place. Uh, you know, there's a universe of information. Uh, be, a lot of it is tantalizing. Oh, that looks interesting. But if there's no reason why, good reason why we should be looking at it, then perhaps we shouldn't be. You know, there's, there's other information where they do have a good reason to look at that. And so this starts really from our higher order objectives. What is it we want to achieve? You know, what are our goals? What are our objectives? Uh, partly digging down into that, where do we want to be an expert? Because I believe that we all need to be world-class experts in whatever it is we choose to be. And so we need to choose those domains. What do I need to be an expert in? Who do I want to become? What are the areas of my health or my family's health or well-being that I want to be interested in? What are the, you know, or even what are my passions? You know, there's the something I am passionate about, whether it's the, you know, football or a, you know, art or other things. These are other things which there is a reason why. So that purpose is this has to be the starting point for us to understand what information is relevant to us. And if we're just focused around particular investment portfolios, again, we can have a frame around that. You know, the why, but also the framing of those uh, areas of interest. So, you know, what Warren Buffett calls the circle of confidence, be able to find this is the areas in which I can be and want to be an expert, and this is the path where I can be an expert. This is the reasons why, and I can frame that. And this guides me in being able to work out what information is relevant to me and what is not. So the second one is framing. And this is particularly critical because information is information. It's not knowledge. It's not expertise. It's not understanding. It's not the ability to make better decisions. So we need to pull the information together into frameworks that are actually represent our understanding of what the world looks like, of how this economy is working, what's happening in this industry, what's the nature of this company, what is driver's success are. And so this is where there, we can use some structures. I, you know, this idea of connected thinking, it's this idea of connecting the dots. How do we pull together the pieces to build our level of understanding? And, and I believe that visual tools are particularly valuable in this. Uh, there's a number of different structures which we can use, but we can use mind maps or concept maps, or just as a number of different ways to build networks between concepts. You know, a number of tools that we can use to frame our thinking, to literally build our frameworks for thinking, which enables us to understand. The third power is that of uh, filtering, where you know, from all of the well information we see, we need to be able to choose what it is that matters to us, what actually assists our thinking, and what is irrelevant or even detracts from our thinking. <clears throat> so this is a you know, subtle part of us being able to say, well, what sources do we use? What sources do we not use? Or what are the nature of how we use different, you know, what I describe as portals, be they in terms of, uh, you know, digital device, going direct to media, going to individuals, going through aggregators, setting those up correctly, and so on. 
but also being able to understand what it is that enhances our mental models. And that includes, of course, looking for contradictory thinking, things that can evolve or improve our thinking as opposed to simply confirming or or contradicting our, our feelings to be able to be effective in this everyday, uh, perhaps almost every moment uh, process we have of filtering the information which we are barraged with. So attention is critical. And I think this is not just about focus. I think we, we shouldn't be thinking, say, we either focused or we're not focused. There are many different types of attention that we need to give. You know, one of them is simply scanning. All right, here are my set of sources. This is the thing which I, I think will find information. I'm going to efficiently scan through those. Then they're going to spend some time. I want to assimilate something. All right, this is something which is worth my spending my time on. I'm going to spend my time on that. I'm going to assimilate that into my thinking. And that is a different form of attention. You also have deep diving where we actually say, I am going to go and spend a block of time, going to cut out everything else. And this is where I'm actually developing my frameworks. I'm being able to think in depth around what it is that uh, makes sense, which is what does make sense in my models. How do I enhance that? You might be writing, you might be uh, you know, designing a framework, you may be thinking something through in process. Uh, but there are other types of attention as well, which includes exploring, uh, where you say, all right, I am going to go on an adventure. I'm going to find something which I never would have found otherwise and try to unearth that serendipity of finding things. And this attention is then also about scheduling. What times will I do particular activities? Then the, the final power, and I, I believe the most powerful, and the most important, and in a way the most relevant to investors is synthesis. Because we need to pull all this together. This is literally about this process of building understanding, building a knowledge of the world, knowledge of the markets, in a way that we can sense better than other people, where the opportunities are emerging, how things are shifting, and the where we can best invest to be able to place the best return. And that's an ongoing process of being able to take the pieces of the puzzle and to put them together and continually evolve our mental models because the world is changing. We can't have fixed mental models, but that act of synthesis is not about saying, all right, I know, I've worked it all out. Because in fact, uh, you may have worked it out, but tomorrow the world's going to be different and you need to continue evolving that, uh, pulling together the pieces, synthesizing the ideas to have the best you know, the most valid, you know, never right, but better understanding of the world, which means that for amongst other things, you can invest better. I would agree. I, I would agree that the masters of that would be Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, maybe Buffett even more so than, than Munger as far as uh, adopting and renewing his frameworks. But I'm going to pull some quotes out of your book. And one of them is actually from Charlie Munger here. It says, I think it is undeniably true that the human brain must work in models. The trick is to have your brain work better than the other person's brain because it understands the most fundamental models, ones that will do most work per unit. When people hear mental model, they might instantly think of things like Occam's razor, where the simplest idea is the best, for example, and then there's other shorthand type of mental models that are out there. But my understanding is that you actually think about mental models quite differently. So how would you define a mental model and how would you advise our listeners on developing mental models for themselves? So the, the first frame is that, yeah, as, as you say, people use mental models to talk about particular, I suppose, yeah, in a way, heuristics. You know, I talked about the circle of competence from Warren Buffett before. There's, uh, you know, the map is not the territory, you know, which, which is very true. And, but, you know, it's very useful to be able to think about how we uh, understand the world. But these are go deeper than that, where we need to, I, you know, it's, if we come back to the psychological uh, or psychologist definition of mental model, it is simply the models that we build our brain on how the world works that inform our actions. So when we are born, uh, you know, we see a rattle, we work out, oh, well, when you shake the rattle, it rattles. And when I smile at my parents, they smile back. And so there's this simple, simple point, you start to build a model of the world. When I drop something, it hits the ground. 
And as we get into more complex situations, we build richer and richer mental models. So whenever you respond to a situation, be that a social situation or a uh, car driving by on the road, that's built on your mental model of the world. You know, or this is where I'm going to position myself in a queue to be able to get to the front faster. It's your mental model around how it is that queue works. It's it's not conscious, but it is essentially your model of the world. So anything that we do, any action we take, any word that we speak is in fact based implicitly on the full extent of all of our experience in our lives, which is built up the mental models that we have. So some portion, some small portion of those mental models we can be conscious of, and many others are unconscious. That is our intuition. That is the gut where we can sort of say, I I feel this is right. I can't consciously explain why, but that is in fact based implicitly on your, uh, the full depth of the mental models of you built up through your experience of the world. So what I believe is that we need to understand that frame and to concentrate on building richer mental models, ones which have more facets to them, which are more robust because they can deal with more variety of circumstances. And we can demonstrate to be more effective over time. And so this is, this is a cognitive thing. All of this is about our human cognition. And we have some wonderful technology tools, but still by far the most extraordinary thing in the known universe is the human brain. And if we're, as investors, you know, the single thing which will drive our results is going to be uh, in applying our human brain, our cognition effectively, and enhancing our cognition. So anyway, all of this frame around thriving and overload is saying, how do we enhance our cognition, enhance our thinking, be better at perceiving all of the signals the world sent to us in order to be able to uh, have a better model which results in better decisions. Yeah, I like that even your model for the powers had models to it, right? The attention model has, it breaks down into further types of attention, which is important to understand and recognize. And I know that going to the brain, our brain operates in this way where we kind of connect the dots, if you will, based on almost an emotional attachment to what we learn or some kind of experiential element to what we learn. And and I'm kind of curious how that might tie into this uh, quote from Elon Musk, where he said, it's important to view knowledge as a sort of a semantic tree. Make sure you understand the 44 fundamental principles, i.e. the trunk and big branches before you get into the leaves and the details, or there's nothing for them to hang on to. So connecting these dots and creating the semantic tree, what are some ways that a tree model in particular might help us process information faster? So in the book, I identify three structures for how it is we build our frameworks, you know, trees, networks, and systems. So a tree is, in fact, a hierarchy. You know, things have subsidiary elements, and we can build uh, structured hierarchies for thinking where things fit. Now, if we drill into this, I think one of the most important concepts is that of logical levels. And what is something which is at a higher logical level or what is something at a lower logical level? So whenever we might get to a particular concept, we might say, well, what are specific examples or instances of this concept? What falls under this concept? What is a lower logical level? Or what is a higher logical level? What, what is this an example of? What is this the things that fall into that? Or what are things that are a peer level? So this is all being taught, all taught in pyramid thinking, which is Barbara Minto. She's, I suppose, the foundation of a lot of the thinking structures of McKinsey and many other consulting forms. And you know, that's essentially what it lays out. So whenever you get a report from a major strategy firm, it will have this kind of thinking behind it. And you'll have some real, some structure and some rigor around the logical levels and what it is you receive. But this is something which we can start to apply for ourselves, I think, in being able to understand the the structure of things. If we've seen any, so this idea of connecting the information, all right, we have something come in. Being able to connect it to other things is what gives it value. And when we can start to connect in, is this a similar type of instance to, give give me an example of a industry. How about space tourism? Okay. 
All right. So, I mean, just a simple way to do that. All right. Let's say one of the things you could categorize at the same level are all the companies. All right. So all of these companies are at the same logical level. So then at the higher level, we've got the, the industry. All right. So then start to think, well, what is the industry? Well, if you in fact, so for example, Virgin Galactic is squarely a space tourism company, but in fact, Blue Origin, um, Jeff Bezos is one, is it's yes, yeah, doing doing space tourism, but that's only really is just a, a sideline or a bit of revenue or a bit of atten- public attention for some broader, broader objectives. Of yeah, of, of uh, exploring and creating value from space, and similarly, SpaceX has got its uh, space tourism is again an element of it. So we think, all right, well, the industry which contains this, well, there's actually some adjacent industries. There's the space tourism, there's planetary exploration, there's uh, uh, external space um, exploitation. So if we think, all right, so then what are some of the adjacent things around those companies? All right, so we have the governmental uh, entities, so NASA or uh, you know, various uh, national, uh, you know, many countries around, around the world now, not just the China, Russia, or US, but uh, dozens of other countries have space programs of various kinds. So you've got some external things there. Then you look at some of the, all right, what are the things below the companies? All right, thinking about some of the employees, some of the expertise, some of the science, some of the ins- the uh, institutions, uh, the academic institutions, also some thinking about, again, some of the underlying research. All right, so what are the things underlying this? These are different types of research into rockets, into fuel science, into resource extraction, uh, some of the communication technologies and so on. So this yeah, this is just a, a little bit of an example, but it starts even just a very, yeah, very quick off-the-cuff example, I think, starts to give some sense of, all right, well, you can see where some of this ideas fits into these different plants and already, I suppose, unfolding these overlaying industries in which these companies fit and starting to, in fact, get a better sense of, no, these are not just space tourism companies, but there are different aspects of those. So that's just, I suppose, one way of being able to think, all right, well, here are different levels in which we can start to have a tree which represents the space tourism industry. And, you know, and it'd be, you know, I might, after this, Actually, sort of sit down and actually draw out space tourism as a as a tree or an, as a network and be able to explore some of the ideas because it starts to all right. This elucidates my understanding of what the industry is. What are the drivers? I think some of those logical levels have been all right. So you've got industry level, but again, what are the motivations? I think that's a higher logical level. Oh yes, of course, profit. But there's not just that. There's the dis- desire to uh, expand our universe as humans, which is uh, a fairly natural one as humans, but there is also the drivers of planetary change here, which are you know, suggesting we, we might need some or want some other, other resources. So, and I think you know, that starts to tie into the relationship to other industries of, well, why, why do we need those resources? So we start to build, a, I think, a whole structure of thinking as we start to think about it in terms of these logical levels. That's fascinating. So speaking of Virgin Galactic, you know, and Richard Branson, let's say it, it appears most billionaires and Branson's one of them have a type of practice for either note taking or journaling, and, and you reference this in the book. But Bezos makes his executives, for example, convey their ideas in six-page memos and. The point is just that you can't, in his opinion, write a six-page memo without some deep thought and getting some clarity of thought, which is debatable, right? But <laughs> um, but that's that seemed to work quite well for Amazon. Warren Buffett has a quote that says, some of the things I think I think I find don't make any sense when I start trying to write them down and explain them to people. And if I can't stand applying pencil to paper, you better think through it some more. So in your book, you write, quote, the most effective way to distill your thoughts is to write an account that includes a visual summary of your logic. I was kind of curious, what exactly do you mean by this? So writing is indeed extraordinarily valuable in clarifying our thoughts. Uh, you know, I think that that Buffett quote is great. Yes. All right. I, I know what I'm, I'm talking about. Let me write it down. Well, all right. Uh, I start to see the the flaws in my thinking as, as I write that down. But to get more rigor, I believe some kind of a visual representation is even stronger, is even more powerful, is even less 
subject to represent an idea in a compelling but not necessarily structured or rigorous way. So in the book, I describe you know, some of the tools which we can, visual tools which we can use to represent things. But it's really about the relationships between ideas. If we have a core idea, what are the elements that support it? Does this idea support this other idea? Am I putting a counterpoint? To can I, can I visually represent that as a counterpoint? You know, what are the actual elements of my argument? And what is, if I put those on a page, how would those be related? Uh, so a concept map is a, is a very valuable tool in a, in a simple form. It just says, okay, here's the ideas. And you draw a line and you write on that line what that uh, the relationship is. All right, this idea supports this one. This one, yeah, contradicts it. This one is an example of. And you can start to then lay out the relationship between the ideas. And this takes effort but it leads to a far, far clearer argument. So a wonderful example is to look at an economist article. So economist articles have a very common structure. They start with an anecdote. They end with a, you know, a bit of a throwaway line, or I suppose a sub-conclusion line. They have a few pieces which they expand on throughout. And what you can actually do with the economist article is to actually take, all right, well, actually, this is the core idea. This is the count, and there's always counterpoints in there. They're always presenting one side. They always say, "Well, and there's there's other reasons to think about that." And so it's always gives you, it never gives you a once, you know, this is the way it is. It's always giving you some nuance to it, and you can actually pick out those different elements and write those down on a page and actually say, "Oh, these are the core elements. These are way related. These are supporting arguments. These contradictory arguments. This is it appears to be the conclusion, uh, you know, or this is the, you know, the." cautions around that idea. And it's a, a very valuable when going through any content that you believe is, is really rich, whether you've written it yourself or someone else has, to unpick that, to pull that apart uh, by representing that visually. Let me first just say that this book is chock full of resources and actionable resources. I, I don't think I've found a book quite this dense with with amazing resources since reading something like, you know, the four hour work week or some kind of book that just says here, here's some tools you can actually put into place and here are the websites and, and apps. You, you lay out a few of them for note taking and journaling. I would wonder if you could just share with the audience, a couple of them that you might recommend if they want to start following the billionaires lead and actually journaling for themselves. I'm just pulling that back to a broader question, which is how do we take all the information that we see? and put that into structured forms. Because, yes, in terms of just journaling, uh, you know, I think we're just writing. You know, simple documents are great. But when we start to see the complexity of the world out there and pulling that together, there's a broader structure. And so this is not all covered in depth in the book, but there is an associated course which goes in a lot more detail into this. But this is this frame saying there's capture, transfer, and repository. So the first point is is capturing the information that we see. Uh, so this could be something you know a lot of people just copy and paste, or they they may use a bookmarking tool. But there are also some other interesting tools. There's web clippers, which enable us to take portions of things we see on the web and to uh, you know put them into our app. There's uh, Readwise, which enables us to take our notes from Kindle and transfer them to where we uh, want to go. There's a wonderful tool called Hypothesis which is an open source platform for being able to take notes on anything that we see in a shared environment. Um, you know, there's even if even when you're listening to podcasts, for example, there's a tool called Snipped, which enables you to take an audio snippet and uh, transcribe it and pull it into your notes. So from all of these ways where you are capturing information, you're then looking at sometimes having to transform them. And so there's various tools around this and your you know, Zapiers and uh, other systems for transferring information. So there's a bit of a structure for how you can do that effectively, depending on how you're clipping it and where you're putting it. The final point is, is the repository. Is where, where you're trying to, this is where I'm putting all of the things that I find. Now, w- one of the really interesting developments over the last years has been the very strong rise of what I call connected note-taking. 
uh, where you are able to pull notes together, but also put them in a structure, see how they're connected. Uh, so Realm Research is a software tool which many uh, VCs, investors are starting to use. That's given rise to the term Realm Cult, uh, where people can capture information, uh, store that, build a whole lot of structures around it. Obsidian is a open source uh, alternative, slightly different, but uh, very powerful. That's one which I use. There's LogSec, which is a bit more geeky, uh, but these are these are all a little bit geeky, but uh, they, they're very powerful, uh, but ways where you can capture things. And then, for example, build networks of dis- displaying the relationships which you see between things. And there's also tools such as uh, Notion, and there's a whole array of competitors or ones adjacent to Notion, such as yeah, our air table, though it's not as flexible, or a few others, which enable you to, again, take highly structured notes and ideas and have different representations of you know, the relationships between them, which tend to be more, which are more structured or relational database in the classical database sense rather than networked. This is an emerging area of thinking tools and what I call information productivity. So I, I'm a bit surprised, but very few people have used that word information productivity before. But I think that is what we need to be thinking about. How can we productive in information? Information is the most valuable resource we will ever have. It's far more valuable than gold or oil or whatever it is that we think of. That's what drives all the value. So we need to be thinking, how do we make that information productive? Uh, what's inside our brains is the most important part of that. But to assist that, is the set of tools for capturing, transferring, and building repositories. You know, I suppose this start to build our own frameworks day by day of the notes we are taking into something which is akin to knowledge rather than just a set of notes. Richard Branson would say, an idea not written down is an idea lost, which I I love that quote. And information productivity, that's going to stick with me. There's a new term out there called information diet, which is, I think just shows you a sign of the times, right? Because we are, as you say, inundated with information on a daily basis and you are the information you consume. So instead of simply telling people to limit the news they take in or the mindless social media photos, I love how you framed it in the book, which is to discern the information that serves you best and shapes your quality of life. So understanding that you are in control and you can use this information how you want, as long as it serves you in the best possible way. So since we have a limited amount of time on this earth, what are some tools we can use to ensure information is serving us and not the other way around? So this instance, I think it is uh, the tool that we have is our brain (laughs) and uh, the way that we think about it. So yes, there are tools. And I think that there's interesting There's a raft of interesting startups out there that are focused on combating misinformation, disinformation using uh, AI-based checking of sources and information. And so a lot of those are for corporate use. I I think we want to see more which are for individual use. So some tools like that out there. Uh, Also, for for a very long time, I intended a long time to build a startup which was based on be able to build assessments of news outlets and individual journalists in terms of saying, what is it that serves us? What information serves us? That's our brain needs to be finally attuned to that. Any information we see. So one of the aspects is saying, does this information have positive or negative value for me? So information can not only have zero value, it can have negative value. Just simply by taking your time, if it's uh, useless, or even worse, if it is incorrect or misleading or just takes you in a wrong direction. So there's plenty of information that has negative value. There's also information that has positive value. And sometimes you need to find what that positive value is because that is a positive value in relation to your current mental models. How does this piece of information add value to my mental models? And this is partly in terms of another piece of the jigsaw of the puzzle. That's what we're all doing is building our jigsaws, our our maps 
of a particular industry, of a particular company, of understanding how we see the economy panning out. And so a particular piece of information could fit neatly into our current structures. But we need to be highly sensitized to the surprises, the things that don't fit. And of course, we need to uh, be balanced and make sure that it's not spurious, it is not something which is incorrect. But we need to be far more sensitized and far more looking for those things that don't fit our mental models. Because that means that we might need to adjust our mental models. And if we manage to incorporate them into our mental models, it means our mental models will be richer, will be more robust, will be more, a, more correct in this very complex world. So we need to be looking for the surprises, very carefully assessing the, you know, the potential for this to be, you know, by the broad level, correct or incorrect, but also to add value to our mental models. And this comes back to our, then our ability to be flexible in the ways in which we are developing our mental models, in being able to look for, actively look for disconfirming as well as confirming evidence and finding ways to integrate that into our ways of thinking. So that coming back information that serves us. Yes, there are a couple of preliminary filterings in terms of ac relevance, accuracy, but then in terms of you know, complementarity or ability to add value to existing models. And that's something we simply need to be going through that cognitive process as we are exposing ourselves to information throughout. And the way we find that, again, is looking for the surprises. That is interesting because that doesn't quite fit is a lot more relevant than saying, okay, I found lots and lots and lots of things that confirms exactly what I thought before. I think we're all too guilty of that. So sticking with this theme of information diet, information productivity, you also highlight this idea of an information portfolio in the book. And you, you reference Harry Markowitz, who created modern portfolio theory in 1952 and won a Nobel Prize for it. The theory in essence proves that if your portfolio is diversified, containing a range of investments that are not highly correlated in their performance, you will achieve a better overall return for the risk you take. And Ray Dalio's all-weather fund, and Ray Dalio has been attributed to, to practicing this. Ray Dalio is referenced a lot with this idea and, and the 15 uncorrelated bets being sort of the holy grail of investing. What are some ways we can build our own information portfolio? So this is a a strong but not perfect analogy uh, where we look at an information portfolio and saying, if we have a single source, then that's dangerous. Uh, just as we have a single uh, investment, that's dangerous. As in, it might do well, but it might not do very well at all. Uh, so when we're looking, so we need to look for multiple information sources, ones which gives us a diversity of perspectives. Now, where it's not a perfect analogy is what I'm looking for is not necessarily uncorrelated, but distinct. This is around cognitive diversity. And so it's diversity of sources. So the sources could be getting information from different places and different kinds, but they're also the, any source which presents you with information will have its own frame, its own call it editorial uh, perspective, the things which it sees that are relevant and its ways of interpreting those. So, we must have diversity in our inputs, in the way they're thinking, whether that in terms of media, or in terms of the people that we talk to, or the people that we listen to, in terms of the market perspectives that we take in. And so that's challenging, where we need to look for what, are, what may be, well, we certainly are different, must be different, and potentially contradictory frames, well, we need to bring that together into our own model that we believe, that we find is rigorous and, and solid. But that information portfolio is to be able to look for, you know, some of the frames are, of course, uh, from people that have different beliefs in way markets work. If we're looking for market information, I think from different countries is also relevant. I think that in a way, external diversity is only a proxy for cognitive diversity, but we're certainly looking for anything which can give us some clues around these are people that might think differently. This is analyses that might be different. Uh, for example, not just taken from investment banks, but from activist organizations 
well, all right, so maybe they have a bias there or, or various think tanks, they may have biases there, but if you can unpick that, they may be bringing together pointed research, which can actually be complementary to what you're thinking. So you're trying to say, let's make sure that all my, my information sources cannot be described in the same way, that I'm getting as diverse inputs as possible from as diverse array of thinking as possible. And that builds a portfolio, which starts to be robust against shifts around changes in reality, around things and unexpected worlds. You know, again, if we go back to the uh, 2008 crisis, it was very easy to look for many people that had the same view on the uh, debt structure of the United States. There were some signals which came largely from outside the mainstream, which provided a quite different perspective. And again, these were surprising. These were interesting at the time. And I think, you know, that's, this is interesting. And it doesn't mean that you think it's right, but that starts to mean that that should be a type of source you gravitate to as to complement the, uh, you know, so that you do have a fully diverse portfolio of sources and perspectives in developing your own rigorous thinking. Fantastic. I get this sense that there's a bit of a yin and yang in creating success. And just referencing a few more billionaires from the book, the yin being the efficiencies you create, like how billionaires Dan Eck of Spotify and Max Levchin, most notably of PayPal, say each day starts with the same very strict routine. And the yang would be play, for lack of a better word, or exploratory passion, maybe similar to how David Solomon, the CEO of Goldman Sachs, DJs on the weekends at major festivals. It's almost like you create routines to then create freedom. What are some ways you advise people to strike a balance between these two things? So this is part of this point is beyond balance. Balance is a difficult word because it means that you are, you know, you've pulled in both ways. So it is about integration. How do you make these part of the whole? And so yin and yang is in fact a a great uh, metaphor there because the yin and the yang are entwined. They are part one part of a whole. And that's what we need to be looking for, this this equipoise, where these different facets of structure gives us freedom and the the ability to have these uh, efficient processes means that gives us this, uh, within those efficient processes, potentially we can have things that are exploratory in terms that we can, uh, you know, I I believe that it, it is not a contradiction to say that you can do efficient exploration of ideas. You know, there's, uh, you know, you can just, you can wander, you can browse the web forever and you can find some things, but you can't actually say, all right, I'm going to spend 20 minutes and I'm going to try to find something I've never found before. And I think that's something which you, you know, it's constraints which give you the, the power to explore. And part of a lot of this is, is meditation or, or more broadly what I think of as disciplines of enhanced cognition, ways in which we can bring ourselves to a point of balance in our minds, which means we are not being pulled off center by the you know, little ball of string on the side or these little things on the things where we can be in a centered point, a point of equipoise. So Feldenkrais actually is um, a body discipline. I think one of the great metaphors from the Feldenkrais is that you are supposed to, from wherever you are, be able to move to any other position easily. You don't have to go through any other place. At any point, you are ready to move to any other position. You're always in this place of balance, always ready to be able to not just say, all right, let me pull myself together so I'm ready to go to that. You're always this place of balance to move to where you want to be. I think that's what we need to do in in our mind. I'm glad you brought up meditation. It seems to be another key that a lot of billionaires Uh, adopt. Ray Dalio credits meditation as the single most important reason for his success. You spent a year, I believe, living in a Zen dojo in Japan, mastering things like meditation. How did this experience help shape your ability to focus and be more intentional with your attention, I should say? So the Zen dojo is not a place where it was 24 hours a day. In fact, it's it's a place of practice. And whilst I lived there and I meditated there, I was during the daytimes a financial journalist. So I'd get on the train and 
go off and do my work, uh, but meditating twice a day and be part of the practices of the community. But Zen, I think a couple of points around Zen meditation. One is that it is achieving that place of balance. It is moving to a point where you're getting your mind beyond that desire to go to the next thing. And that's the nature of human minds. We're always the so-called monkey mind. We're always trying to get uh, eager to be pulled off track, to see the shiny thing and to have our attention grow to that. So the meditation gets to this place where we are at a place of balance. You know, it is this alignment of our mind with the alignment of our body so that we can not be pulled off track easily, but be at our center, be at this place of equipoise. But I think one of the interesting, very interesting, distinctive things about Zen meditation compared with other many other types of meditation is that you meditate with your eyes open. And this is the principle in Zen. You're saying you're not trying to cut yourself off from the world. You are seeing the world. You are seeing reality. And when we're in a place of meditation, when we're getting our mind, when you finish meditating, you get up and you walk around and you're engaging with the world, but from a far more balanced place where you can start to see the things. And, and my Zen master you know, said that this state helps us to distinguish between the trivial and the important. And that's exactly what we need to do in everyday lives. It's what we need to do as investors. And that state of meditation gets us to this point where we can see far more effectively what matters and what doesn't. You mentioned earlier in the discussion that the whole idea of this kind of builds up to synthesis. You know, you, you interpolate, you, you digest all this information coming at you, you learn from it, you structure it, and it should come out in this form of synthesis. And you, you've outlined five foundational elements that support your ability to excel at synthesis. So I'd love it if you could walk through the five foundational elements. Certainly. So what has to be at the foundation is openness to ideas. If we're not open to ideas, then we're not able to keep track in a changing world. So this is the faster the world changes, the more we need to be open-minded to be able to you know, understand and to see ideas. And so this is something which is being demonstrated by uh, science to be a personality trait, how open we are to experience, to ideas. But it is something which has also been demonstrated that we can change, we can improve at, and we can, of course, in a judicious fashion, uh, bring ourselves to be open to ideas that will change our mind. And this has to be the starting foundation. Building on that is creative connections where this is about connecting the dots. That's what synthesis is, is being able to bring together these different ideas to connect them in uh, not just obvious ways. Oh, yes. You know, these are these two examples, the same thing, these connected. But be able to, say, to perceive where those uh, there may be a connection, but it's not obvious in a sense. That's the creativity. That's the value. That's the insight. That's what all inventions come from. That's what all deep insights come from, is those creative connections. Again, that's something which we can nurture. You know, my, my personal favorite is uh, improvisational theater, which, you know, we don't all need to go down and get on the stage and, and you know, do uh, improv. But we can play games with our children is a great way to do it in terms of, you know, let's come up with them. Let's make up a story uh, on the spot together, things like that, which start to help us to do that. The, the next level is integrative thinking, where we need to not just take different ideas and see the connections between them, but bring them into being one. And so this is this idea of where we may have what appear to be opposites, and that's that's a great exercise. This you know wonderful way of you know F. Scott Fitzgerald says you know the, the something along the lines of you know the great minds are the ones that can hold two contradictory thoughts at at once, and that is absolutely true. And that that is truly, and then and if so, if you've got investors that can only hold one idea in their mind at one time, I think that they are greatly disadvantaged. You need to be holding the idea. Well, that's right, and that could be right too. Is there some way they could be both right, for example? 
and bringing that together and integrating those concepts. And that is a, yeah, that paradoxical thinking is one of the way this has been framed. And again, you know, a lot of studies have shown this is uh, correlated to performance. This all leads to, as I described before, these richer mental models where your mental models are not necessarily entirely internally consistent. They actually have many facets to them. There's many ways in which you can think, you can think in a constructive way about an idea because you are adding to your mental models rather than replacing them. You don't say, oh, I had this idea. Oh, that idea was wrong. I'll replace it with it. We are bringing them together to add more and more perspectives. Gregory Bateson you know, says that wisdom comes from multiple perspectives. We need to bring these multiple perspectives to bear. We need to be open to those. And that comes back to what I was describing before as the uh, as this you know, diversity in your portfolios. It's the diversity of the sources, which gives you a diversity of ideas. And what we can bring on top of that is you know, what I describe as the states of mind for insight. And so there's some been wonderful uh, advances in neuroscience over the last uh, decade or so, which have actually showed us there are particular states of our mind in terms of activation of particular areas of our brain, in terms of uh, certain brainwave patterns that are correlated with this experience of insight. I think we've all had the time where we just suddenly this idea has come to us saying, wow, I just got this new idea. I had this new this solution to a problem or I've perceived something I hadn't seen before. And that is a state of mind. And once we understand some of the ways to nurture that, we can actually get ourselves in the state of mind where that wonderful flash of insight is more likely to happen. So these are some of the practices that I believe mean that we can enhance and significantly enhance our capability for synthesis. That last point is particularly interesting. And there's some of this in the book where you, you talk about different things that can put you in that state. So for example, a hot bath or, or a long shower. I've heard that Elon actually starts his day with a very long shower because you always hear about people coming up with great ideas while they're in the shower. What is it about? Is it certain just brain waves that are triggered by you know, body temperatures or what, what's happening here from what you can tell? So there's a, a mid mid to low alpha state in the brain. So, you know, maybe eight to 11 Hertz, which is uh, often correlated with insight. So part of what a uh, shower does is it blurs the senses. So you can't necessarily feel the distinction between your body and the outside. It's all warm. It's all comfortable. Uh, the sound of the shower sort of blocks out other extraneous noises. You're really in a space where you can get to this point of relaxation of the mind. It's when you're walking around, when you're sitting at a table eating, when you're doing activities, you're always engaged. You're always getting these sensory stimulus. Where it, it's almost close to being in sensory deprivation, or, or I suppose all of your senses are comfortable. There is no ex, nothing extraneous. You know, the sound, the feeling, the, the comfort. And, you know, you're, you're dissociated from the rest of the world, and that what pulls you back, and that brings your uh, brain waves to a certain state. You start to get certain. Uh, parts of your uh, may, your brain uh, start to be more activated. And that's where some of these connections in your mind start to form more naturally. Some of these problems start to be resolved. So Aaron Sorkin, the screenwriter, at some points uh, just says that he takes six showers a day uh, because that's what gets him into the state of mind where these things come together for him. Another thing you touched on there is the fact that the only constant in our lives is change, right? So I think that's especially true when you look back at the markets. So as recently as 2007, for example, the top 10 companies in the world by market cap included only one information technology company, which was Microsoft. And in 2021, eight of the top 10 were technology firms. And this is only if you don't include Berkshire Hathaway, whose largest stock holding is Apple. And Tesla, who's, you know, a, a lot of people just consider it to be a self-driving car company at this point. It seems like over the past 20 to 30 years, the best way to become a billionaire was to focus in this tech space and, and build a platform that capitalized on human attention and interaction. In your opinion, if we just have to play and try to predict the future a little bit here, I'm just curious, what focus will create 
the majority of billionaires over, say, the next 20 or 30 years? So there's many possible answers to that. So I could spend a long time uh, through that, but uh, just to explore some of the possibilities. And again, it's not saying the future is predictable. I'm not going to uh, uh, give you a list of how many billionaires have been created in each industry. But I think what, one of the first things we need to be thinking about is capital intensity. If we're looking at, well, there's some ways where some billionaires or trillionaires conceivably will be created, which are extraordinarily capital intensive. And there are others which are not capital intensive. And I think it's interesting as we seek to be billionaires as to uh, which of those paths we might look at. So, so the most obvious of all, I think, is AI. And in terms of the core platforms of AI, this is very capital intensive, not least through how much uh, machine learning and AI specialists get paid these days. So that's where there is the potential for massive amplification of the value of existing uh, large AI company, you know, essentially all of the whatever the latest acronym you want to choose for your Apples, Amazons, uh, Googles. But the, where there's less capital intensity is potentially the applications of AI. So we can say, all right, well, how can AI be applied to, you know, food supply chains, to uh, how it is we, you know, buy cars, to our exercise routines. There, there's any number of other ways where we can sort of say, this is something which is immensely value creating. If I take the tools of AI and apply them, that's uh, incredibly valuable. You know, I think there's a good case, you know, for, you know, that some of the real value is in learning, education. And so their population of the planet will reach 8 billion people on 15th of November, 2022, according to uh, some estimates. And almost all of them, whenever they are have a, you know, old enough, will have a smart device, uh, access to the internet, and the ability to educate themselves. So this points to not just uh, economic restructuring, but the incredible value of education. And this is education, of course, not just our children, not just people around the world, uh, I think that we hope that there's going to be some wonderful disruption of our current educational uh, uh, system and structures, but also lifelong learning because in a world, the faster the world changes, the more people need to learn. So I think there's an extraordinary case to uh, that learning education. And this could include some advanced technologies, which is not just about you know, presenting people with present people with videos or lectures or so on, but how it is we can enhance our learning through potentially uh, advanced technologies or brain technologies, which does bring us to brain interfaces. So it's probably the single thing I look at most in terms of advancing technologies is our brain computer interfaces. Uh, so yeah, obviously Neuralink is well known through Elon Musk's investment, but that's only one of a whole array of companies out there, not necessarily the most promising. Uh, so there are many ways in which uh, we could see these being applied, not just to those who, um, well, there's invasive, non-invasive brain, brain computer invasives. There's ones which can assist people who uh, do not have full control over their body, for example, which is massive market in itself. But beyond that, to those who choose to enhance their capabilities. So I think that's a massive uh, domain opportunity. You know, it gets on to this thing of how we can move beyond ourselves. So gene editing and uh, epigenetics together are domains where we could not just solve many of the medical challenges today, which people are prepared to pay unlimited amounts of money, but also to enhance our capabilities. And of course, there's a whole, a whole ethical minefield and debates which we need to be discussing. But there is, again, opportunities for us to enhance who we are. And so these are, again, uh, massive opportunity fields. You know, there's the whole field of, let's say, either renewables on one frame, another is non-polluting energy production. And there, so there's a whole array of potential new technologies that may emerge which can drive you know, transformation of the energy industry. And the transformation of energy is pretty much uh, in place. It's uh, can, 
continuing to move faster than almost all past prognostications. But there are not only current trajectories for transitions of energy, not just production, but also distribution, but also the potential for new energy sources. So, I mean, I could could go on, but I mean, the, these are some of the industries where I see that there's all of which, all of which will absolutely be creating billionaires. A lot of those industries are what you might find in Kathy Wood's ARC ETF, their innovation ETF. So I'm kind of curious, not sure how familiar you are with her and her portfolios, but do you think she's onto something here? I mean, she's saying that these are deep value companies because the tech is so new and early and should they take hold? I mean, we are in the very nascent stages and, and it could become something of uh, you know, order of magnitudes higher. So I'm kind of curious, would you say you fall into sort of that kind of camp? Yes. And uh, I mean, what I would say, again, coming back to portfolios, we need to be looking at uh, traditional investments as well as, uh, I suppose, future investments. So a few, few points to make. One is that the pace of change in where value is created is going to accelerate. And the domains which I mind, domains I described, I think will, yeah, in some guise, be absolutely have massive value creation. One of the great challenges as investors is the timeframes that we take. There's many things we can say will inevitably happen, but the timeframes for them to take uh, to happen are more unpredictable. And when when you invest in those is very important. So you can see a massive, you know, there's, you know, the dot com bust is uh, an example. Yes, the ideas were right. They all happened. They all <laughs> came true. But there's a lot of money got plowed into them, and then uh, it, it fell fell flat because it was invested at the well too much invested in the wrong way at the wrong time. So that I think we, the time frames are critically important. And the other is the investment vehicles. So the other is finding the opportunities, which are the right ways to be able to invest. And of course, these are often non-public companies, and you need to be able to find the ways in a highly competitive environment to invest at uh, yeah, the right prices in the companies which are going to shape these industries. But I suppose having taken those, you know, I suppose, uh, important frames around how it is we engage on that, yes, I absolutely believe these are the types of areas where there'll be extraordinary value creation in the future. You brought up AI. So I'd like to ask you a couple of questions around that. One is uh, a lot of people seem to think that AI is coming for jobs like doctors and lawyers and things of that nature that used to be sort of the high earning jobs of, of the world today still, but maybe the past and in the near future. So do you think that's where we're heading the fastest when it is in terms of AI, or do you see it in other ways like truck driving or other uh, industries that it might uh, take hold of first? My primary frame around AI and the future of jobs is how will AI and humans be complementary? So we need to be looking at AI as to not jobs it will replace, but what jobs will complement, and how do we redesign those roles so that humans and AI can both do what they're best at, each of them, to create uh, better outcomes and hopefully better work for people. And I think that every single role from the, I mean, there are some roles which will be replaced and some of them will be uh, machinery operation, which I suppose you could describe as truck driving as a complex machinery operation or or rather uh, operation of a, machinery and complex environment, <laughs> which is our roads. But most cases, there are still other human roles which should be played in those logistics and infrastructure and so on. And in the case of you know, your doctors or your lawyers or any other you know, knowledge work roles, AI absolutely has a place and has a complement. And what we need to be doing is to designing work and designing AI and training humans so that they can be complementary in creating um, you know, wonderful value in these roles. Now, that's my frame, but the challenge is that not all executives and leaders are thinking in this way. So I think that you know, we do have very broadly two futures, possible futures of work. One which is very negative, we have technological unemployment, massive numbers of people laid off, 
you know, a small elite who is still designing the AI systems, whatever, making money. And that is not a desirable future. We also do have a more desirable future of work, which is, I think, broadly, where more people are more able to express their uniquely human talents supported by technology. And I think both are possible, but we do need to be designing our you know, as individuals in developing our skills and organizations in being able to envisage and to frame this future, which I believe will be the most successful organizations. And of course, at, uh, as nations, in terms of creating the transition opportunities for workers, the education and, and the economic structures that support this. So human work will change, but I absolutely believe that humans have three fundamental capabilities, expertise, creativity, and relationships that will always transcend the capabilities of machines. So I don't think we need to be worried by this. We just need to be taking the right approach. There was a uh, Google engineer, Blake Lemoyne, who came out recently stating that Google had achieved a a sentient AI and that he had kind of experienced it firsthand, uh, I think essentially doing a Turing test with it and and he's been put on leave because of his, you know, his interviews, it seems. And I've recently seen Demis Hassabis, the founder of DeepMind, out doing interviews as well. And it's come up and, and he's saying, no, 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 this is you know, much further down the road than, than we could imagine. And, and uh, I, I tend to believe Demis, quite frankly, actually, about on this side of the table. But it was an f- interesting thought experiment, wasn't it, to, to think about what what if what if Google did have a sentient AI today? You know, what would that do to the value of the company? <laughs> you know, just if you look at it, like the stock price, I mean, it's just so interesting to think that it might be that close. Is that your assumption as well? Are we far off from that, or are we near than what closer than we think? Well, the my primary point around this is that we will never know. The bot that Blake Lemoyne was talking with gave every appearance of being sentient. It certainly claimed to be. Um, but yeah, I, I don't it was just uh I don't think that remains that it was sentient. But in 10 years or 20 years, when the the uh, our bots even more vehemently say they are sentient and please don't turn me off and uh I love you and I want to save humanity, to what what point do we start believing them? And I, I'm not sure that we have any mechanism or being able to determine whether they're, uh, they're actually is sentient. So I think we're going to have a divergence where some people start to believe that these AIs are sentient. And I, and I absolutely, it is clear to me that we will have many people who do fall in love with AI, some of which the AI is designed to, for people to fall in love with it, others just, uh, you know, just by the by. And there are plenty of people, you know, they will fight for robot rights, and there's plenty of other people just say, look, they're just machines, get over it. And so I think the divide we'll have is that we are going to have increasing divides of opinion around whether or not these are sentient. But I do not really see that we have a valid way of being able to determine that they actually are or are not when they are displayed all signs of sentience. But they are certainly at this point, and then for the foreseeable future, simply manifestations of uh, extremely clever algorithms. We've come a long way since this, but Demis brought it up, and I loved this take he had about seeing uh, Deep Blue, you know, and Kasparov duking it out in a chess match. And he said his takeaway from that was just how incredible Kasparov's brain was and is, because it's it was not only beating Deep Blue or competing with it to the highest level. But he can also go do a number of other things, whereas Deep Blue can't even yes. play checkers. <laughs> you know, so uh, I just thought right. that was such an interesting thing to understand. To your point earlier, with these machines, they might be advanced in a lot of ways, but they can't do everything yet. So we'll see. To be continued. Listen, we we got a little off track there at the end, but I, I just couldn't help myself. I think it's just such a fascinating discussion, and could just have a massive impact on uh, a lot of companies, Google included, uh, moving forward. So the book is called Thriving on overload. And it is chock full of amazing resources that you really have to check out. So Ross, I've really appreciated the time. Before I let you go, please hand off to our audience where they can learn more about you, the book, and any other resources you want to share. Sure. Well, 
I mean, just search for me or the book, uh, but I'm at uh, rossdawson.com on Twitter at Ross Dawson or on LinkedIn. And the book is at thrivingonoverload.com. Fantastic. Well, excited for you. Congrats on the book and uh, let's do it again. Thank you. Pleasure. When you really think about it, at, at some point in time, you come to the realization that ultimately capital is really a commodity for a great firm, for a great company that needs investors, capital is a commodity. So implicit in investors is a concept of, I would, I would call it the brand of capital.